morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, really excited to see so many people continue to join us throughout this series. And so I have the pleasure of announcing um, our educator for this morning, Stephen Gardner. He is the senior staff physicist from Henry, Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, Michigan. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Stephen. But everybody feel free as, as usual to write any questions in the chat to the group or um, you can direct them to me and I'll, I'll, help, I'll help direct some of those questions as well. Great. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's a pleasure to present today. So dosimetric leaf gap is the topic. I'm a physicist at Henry Ford in Detroit. I've been there for about seven years and we've commissioned quite a few machines and used this topic quite a bit when we're trying to get a B model that matches the, what we see from the machine. So just in terms of the outline for the lecture today, first, just to get a brief introduction to MLC design and a background on that, and then look at how MLC modeling actually happens in the, a few treatment planning systems, look at what sort of data is used in beam configuration, like measured data, dosimetric data, that's kind of introductory information and then look at how the DLG impacts dose distributions in terms of profiles for static fields, IMRT, VMAP fields, SRS, SPRT, and then also the MLC transmission effects on dose distributions. And then look at how can we measure these things, the dosimetric leaf gap and the MLC transmission values. How can we adjust them? And then just some summary and practical tips and then feel free to stop me at any point and we can go over the material in, in more depth. So um, just starting off with some basic MLC design background, APM TG50 went over quite some time ago, basic applications of multi-leaf col collimators. Uh, this is figure one from that task group report and just showing the divergence of the leaves, looking straight on to one leaf bank and also you can see the tongue and groove here. You can see the rounded leaf edge here. You can see the tongue here and the groove here. These are all design aspects that are attempting to minimize leakage, minimize differences in penumbra as MLCs travel across the field and so on. So in, in general, MLCs are typically composed of some type of tungsten alloy, anywhere from two and a half millimeters I'm sorry, that's a typo, to 10 millimeters thick or uh, wide. And the height ranges from typically five to 10 cm. So that would be this dimension here. And this should be 10 millimeters, I apologize for that. But that's uh, what we're working with for different vendors. And here we just see examples of the Varian and Electa MLC design. Your LINAC may differ just based on the model and year of production, but the idea is we have a uh, tongue and groove that's minimizing the leakage and there's going to be a uh, leaf end that will have to also be able to model well for treatment planning. So in terms of the variant MLC modeling, this is where the bulk of my experience is. The, the modeling of MLCs in the variant treatment planning system for both the tongue, tongue and groove effect and the rounded leaf edge, it basically changes the footprint of the MLC to account for additional material in the tongue and, and uh, difference in the amount of material being seen from a physical standpoint versus a dosimetric standpoint and the rounded leaf end. So we'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but the idea here is that we can change the footprint of the MLC at the leaf end to account for the difference uh, the physical end versus the dosimetric end. And for the Eclipse treatment planning system, one second here. Yeah, so the, the Eclipse treatment planning system, this is the Varian treatment planning system. We can input uh, percentage depth dose, cross line profiles, output factors for the measured beam data. And the dosimetric data includes parameters like the dosimetric leaf gap and MLC transmission. And also the source size or focal spot size, but this is really beyond the scope of this particular lecture, but just include here for completeness. So that was the Varian treatment planning system. We also could take a look at Pinnacle 
you may be using a different treatment planning system from these two, but I'm including these just as representations of how these parameters can be modeled. In the Pinnacle system, this paper actually is included in the Rayos Contra Cancer team. This is a very nice paper describing these parameters and also uh, a process to better model the rounded leaf ends in, you know, for a particular clinical scenario. So there's the MLC leaf offset here, and there's also the leaf tip radius. These are both adjustable parameters in the pinnacle treatment planning system to model the MLC leaf ends more accurately for the clinical deliveries that are being used at, in your clinic. And so that's a little bit of a background on how these things are modeled. We'll move on to how we can measure values for MLC transmission and DLG measurement. So just a little bit more information in terms of conceptual information. We have interleaf transmission, intraleaf transmission, and leaf end transmission. So the idea here is that the inter is between leaf transmissions. So this is leakage between the adjacent MLCs on the same bank. And this is would be an example of the interleaf transmission as we plot the radiation leakage. The intraleaf transmission would be the leakage through a single MLC leaf. And the leaf end transmission is the leakage through or between opposed MLC leaf pairs at the point of abutment. So the each each bank or each side of the MLC system would uh, play a role here. And typically we're quoting the MLC transmission as a percentage relative to the open field measurement. So this this figure is shown not to compare the different vendors, but just to give you an idea that there are variations among vendors and even a, among different MLC systems within the same vendor in terms of the amount of interleaf transmission, intraleaf transmission, and then the, the average of the two. But we see a general trend that, of course, the intraleaf transmission here is going to be a lower value than the interleaf transmission. There's just going to be more leakage where you have adjacent MLC leaves with with a some sort of some sort of physical separation. The tongue and groove is attempting to minimize that. There still be some increase there. So that's MLC transmission. And um, Stephen, can I interrupt? Sorry, one quick thing. It looks like you're not on the full screen right now. If you just go up to the top oh. and hit display settings, then we can get into Sorry the full that. screen. Perfect. Awesome. Yep. Uh, Thank I you. I apologize for that. So if we, let me minimize that too. So ML tra MLC transmission on the measurement side, as, as I mentioned, it, the MLC system is comprised of two banks, opposed leaves, and so when we commission a machine, we got to measure both banks. We want to verify that there's a consistent measurement uh, between the two, the two banks of opposed leaves. And typically in the treatment planning system, we're entering the average value of the two banks that we measure. So shown here would be a farmer type chamber centered in the field. The MLC leaf bank is closed and out of the 10 by 10 jaw based field. So here's the jaw based field, MLC leaves pulled all the way outside of the field. And then the chamber measurement is actually an average reading across multiple leaves. And that, that would be how we would measure the MLC leaf transmission for input into our very entry and planning system. So we would perform this measurement with a 10 by 10 open field, uh, 10 by 10 MLC leaf uh, bank A closed and then also closed the other bank. So it would measure for these sort of darker blue MLCs in the image here. And then also we would pull this intersection all the way over to the other side of the field and measure the other bank. So in this measurement, we're averaging over multiple MLC leaves. And so we're actually using a larger volume chamber. We don't need to try to get a small volume chamber. We actually want the 2CM cavity length you know, 0.6 cc farmer chamber for this. And again, this is a, an average of the inter and intra leaf transmission. So in practice, here's some values from our Linux. This is 6X here, 6X FFF, 
and 15x. And we see that the transmission value for 6x at 1.42%, that's uh, fairly common with the Millennium 120 MLC. That's pretty standard on Varian Linux. 6x FFF, this beam, the, the energy characteristics are slightly softer than 6x, so it's slightly lower transmission. The transmission typically increases with increasing energy, and we see for 15x, it's higher than we see for 6x. In terms of the dependence on energy, typically I've observed the transmission value may go down from, so at 10x, uh, 10x, it may be a maximum, and then it decreases a little bit for 15x or 18x. But the MLC transmission formula is shown here. So we measure the transmission reading for the bank A, measure it for bank B, take the average and then divide by the reading for the open field. So whenever you measure the MLC transmission, I would compare to another set of data with that same linear accelerator to verify your measurements. And so for the dosimetric leaf gap, the DLG, the MLC leaf end is rounded. So we do have a difference here between the physical leaf end, which is shown here, and then this would be the dosimetric leaf end like the 50% isos line. And there's a difference here for an individual leaf. The difference for both leaves is the dosimetric leaf gap. And we'll use this, this concept and this term to help model the delivery for IMRT and VMAT more appropriately. In terms of the measurement, this measurement is just a starting point, but this is a standard procedure used to measure dosimetric leaf gap for the Varian Linux, and you deliver all of the MLC transmission fields first. And so you measure the leaf transmission, as mentioned with open field delivery and then both banks to characterize the transmission for both of those, and then move on to sweeping gap deliveries or sliding window deliveries. So you have a consistent gap size, two, four, six, 10, 14, 16, and 20 millimeters. And these, Gap, uh, sliding window deliveries, they start at uh, negative 6 cm and they go to positive 6 cm, a uh, total of 12 cm or 120 millimeters of travel for the sliding window delivery. And you measure, you measure the dose for each of these. And we'll see on the next slide, we'll correct for MLC, the effective MLC transmission during the delivery to separate that out from the effect of the sliding window delivery. So this is just an example from one of our Linux. So we have the leaf transmission reading here. This is just the average reading for leaf, leaf transmission. We will correct, we will correct the, the gap reading. Sorry, let me move this here. So this would be the RG prime would be the corrected gap reading. So the, the, the correction for the gap reading to correct for transmission would be this formula here. So 120 is the overall travel of the sliding window delivery. And so you're just correcting for the fractional transmission that would be attributable to the amount of the, the fraction of the, the window, sliding window gap versus the overall window travel. So this correction is subtracted from the gap reading to give you the corrected gap reading. This corrected gap reading is then plotted here we have it plotted along the x-axis. The vertical axis is the gap itself. And then we can actually just do a linear trend line and the intercept then is our measured DLG. In this case, this is the uh, linear trend line formula and this would be our DLG, this 0.9777 value. So shown here as well. So that would be the starting point for our beam modeling. So we're not gonna end up using this value. This, this more than likely would not be our final value, but would be the initial point for us. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, maybe we could pause here. And I know we had a few questions in the chat. If anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask their questions. Okay. All right. Feel free to chat me and, and I can read the question as well. Sorry, we can continue. Sounds good. Just a little further information for MLC transmission and DLG measurement. 
typically we're measuring these at 10 cm depth and 90 or 100 cm SSD. Typically for, for my center, we're just keeping it the same as the TG51 setup. So 100 cm SSD, 10 cm depth to the chamber center. My experience is that the actual measurement result is not all that sensitive to the choice of depth or SSD. So these are just kind of my, our personal, our, our institutional experience, you know, and, and what we typically do. But if you did 90 cm SSD at 10 cm depth, I don't think you're not going to get a markedly different result. You could also use a chamber and a solid water phantom, for instance, and you don't need to use a small volume chamber for these measurements. Even the small gap width, the dose gradient that you're delivering over the entire beam is flat. So you don't have a uh, situation with a high dose gradient and therefore you don't need a uh, small volume chamber. And again, I, I can't um, emphasize this enough. The, me the measure DLG is just a starting point for beam modeling. So you'll see that coming up here shortly. So be before we look at how we could adjust the DLG to fit measured data, let's just take a quick look at how it impacts the dose distributions for different uh, types of delivery. So for static fields. Uh, Stephen. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, can I go ahead? Yeah. Uh, why there is no any acceptance testing documents for these kind of leaf measurements, you know, intra, intra leaf and the DLG? We are just accepting the value given by the vendor and we are just, uh, why there is no any acceptance testing document? So that we can say that this is the tolerance limit for these machines, whether it's varying or electra. I'm not, I'm not sure if I understand the question. It might help to maybe write down the question, um, just so I'm clear on what, what exactly you're asking. Uh, I'm sorry. I will, I will type the question. So I, let me see the chat window here. Oh, okay. I can answer this one. So for these measurements, the question is why we use a large volume chamber. And for these measurements, we're measuring fields with that don't have uh, large dose gradients. So just going back, for instance, these are all, these are the, the jaw base field is 10 by 10 as this sliding window delivery uh, is delivered over the course of the 100 MUs that are delivered, it's actually going to be a uniform fluence because this sliding window will be delivered at a uniform velocity as it travels across the field. So when we take the composite reading, so we're, we'll measure the entire field delivery, it's actually a uniform fluence and therefore the, the even a larger volume chamber in the center of the field there won't be any gradient there. And then for the other student that asked a question, if you can type it in, that would be really helpful. And then I perhaps could better understand it and be able to give a, a better answer. So looking at the MLC DLG effect. So this is for a static field. This is the field right here. So uh, these are the jaw jaws here and the MLC bank affecting the, the lateral dimension of the field. And this is a cross line profile going across the field like this. The things to note here are the DLG really is impacting the penumbra, but not the central field dose. So it's affecting the modeling of the leaves right here. And this is looking at a DLG of 0.1 CM versus 0.2 CM. And this is for a static field only. And for the similar type of static field, but just varying the MLC transmission, we see that the out of field dose is affected. So it's not affecting the penumbra or the central field dose. And again, this is MLC transmission now. The MLC transmission will affect the out of field dose. This makes sense, we could predict this, but this is uh, a verification of what's happening within the planning system. So that's for static fields. For IMRT delivery, the DLG, a larger DLG value. So as we increase from 0.115 to 0.14, we see it's impacting the penumbra as well as the infield dose, the higher dose region. And this is one of our test plans that was calculated. And it's a line, this line profile is going through at 
if we look in that coronal plane, it's going through this area right here. So the take home message from my standpoint is that when we go to IMRT, the DLG is gonna affect the entire dose distribution, both the penumbra and the high dose. And this is just emphasizing that, that it's uh, changing both of these aspects of the dose distribution. And then for MLC transmission, we see a similar effect. If we uh, go from, again, this is the same, same test plan, change the MLC transmission will impact the penumbra and also the, uh, the high dose region. This is for IMRT delivery. And take note of the magnitude of the impact here as we look at the impact on from VMAT delivery. So in, with VMAT, when we change the DLG, we see less of an impact in the high dose region and we don't see much impact at all in the penumbra. This is for VMAT delivery. This is a different test plan. So this is emphasizing that point that just we're noticing a smaller change in the high dose regions compared to IMRT when we change the DLG. And the same thing with the change in penumbra width. And when we change the MLC transmission, it's a similar effect. We see a smaller overall effect for VMAT as compared to IMRT. And we'll go over this a little bit more with some of our test plans and looking at it a little bit more quantitatively across the whole spectrum of test plans. Okay, yeah, thank you for the question. So the question is, I'm gonna bring it over to the main window here. So we, we have accepted limits for flatness and symmetry do we have any acceptable values for intra and inter, intra, inter and intra leaf transmission and DLG values? So I'm, I'm not sure if there are accepted values for these parameters for, for each type of LINAC, each type of vendor. So when you perform acceptance testing of the LINAC, there, the measurement of these parameters may or may not be included. If it is included, then there'll be a range that's acceptable. If it's not included in the vendor acceptance testing, then you can compare to other data that's available, either from your colleagues or previous installations at your clinic to, to validate the initial measured data. And then we'll talk about how this data can be used to model the MLC system itself in the treatment planning system. So I don't know of any published acceptable values for these, these parameters. If anyone knows of any, just type it in the chat and then that can be used as a reference. So thanks for that question. I think overall the comparing your data to data from other institutions that have the same linear accelerator, but potentially different measurement equipment is a very valuable part of the commissioning process and would definitely highly encourage that. So looking at how we can adjust MLC parameters, the process for tweaking the B model for IMR, IMRT and VMAT commissioning. All right, so uh, there's a lot here. We'll just step through it and um, then we'll move on to each individual aspect. So the medical physics practice guidelines, MPP G5A, does have a bunch of test, tests that can be done for uh, treatment planning system B model validation. And it's not just for IMRT and VMAT, it actually covers 3D CRT, et cetera. When we take a look at MLC parameter and the B model optimization itself, like any optimization process, it's, it's an iterative process. And so from my experience, the overall process goes something like this. So we acquire the initial measurements for the M parameters. That's like the DLG and leaf transmission. And we input those parameters into the treatment planning system. And then we can calculate the B model. And then we can actually generate and calculate IMRT or VMAP plans for verification. So would highly encourage the use of the TG119 data set and also previous clinical plans if those are available at your center. So TG119 data sets been used for uh, many years and many, many institutions are included in that initial report and many institutions have performed these measurements since. And this is a base, good baseline for your IMRT and VMAT planning. 
So the more to come on this one. For SRS and SBRT planning, it's absolutely critical to use a representative stereotactic plan to validate the B model. In our experience, we have noticed that the optimal MLC parameters for SRS and SBRT planning may be different than the optimal parameters for conventional planning. I'm looking at planning a prostate case versus an SBRT spine or cranial SRS. So we want to be sure, absolutely sure, that we're using stereotactic plans to validate stereotactic B models. And for any type of test plan that we're running and using to verify and validate our B model, we want to make sure that those plans meet the relevant clinical goals and constraints that would be expected for that type of plan. So for the TG119, there's actually clinical goals included with these data sets. For clinical plans, you would maybe need to work with your radiation oncologist to ensure that the plan is meeting the clinical goal and same with any SBRT, SRS type plans. So once these plans are generated and calculated, then we're ready for measurements. And two types of measurements that need to be done, point dose measurement and a planar dose measurement. So a point dose measurement can be performed with an ion chamber. Ideally, the chamber is a small volume chamber at our clinic using the CCO1 or pinpoint chamber, which are considered like micro ion chambers. And when we acquire measurements, we're using high dose readings to simulate the target volumes for placing an ion chamber in a high dose reading in a high dose area where the target would be, and also a low dose reading to measure where uh, critical OARs would be. And in my experience, we're using these point dose measurements as a primary means for MLC parameter selection. We'll go over this in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. And then also we're acquiring planar dose measurements. For instance, you can use gaff chromic film or an array device of some sort, including the EPID to acquire planar dose measurements. And our typical process is we compare results for these once we've optimized MLC parameters a little bit with the, with the chamber readings. So a few practical tips for adjusting parameters on approved B models. So you may already have an approved B model that's in use at your clinic. And so if you have a B model that's already approved and you need to make adjustments for IMRT or BMAC commissioning, just a few tips. The first is use caution. So you want to be very careful about any adjustments to B models that are already in use. So uh, think about what could go wrong before you make any adjustments. Discuss with other physicists to make sure that you thought of everything that could potentially come up and that you uh, have a plan for these things. In addition to caution, communicate. So talk about it with relevant staff. Make sure everyone is on the same page with what the order of events is going to be with testing out, say, the IMRT and VMAT portion of the B model that's already been approved. So once you've use proper caution and made a plan and communicated, then you're ready to calculate. So you wanna plan out the best time to perform the dose calculations with the initial MLC, DLG transmission values. And oftentimes the best time for this is after hours or on a weekend. And a weekend, if it's available at your clinic, will give you plenty of time to perform the calculations and then the next step would be to reset the values back to the approved clinical values for the previously approved clinical B model. So this is very dependent on the workflow that needs to happen, but if you need to change parameters and reset, make sure to reset them in the, you know, before the next clinical operational day. And if you're able to calculate on a weekend, you may be able to test out multiple iterations of the MLC, DLG, and transmission values. Again, this is all very dependent on what the situation is, but after using caution and planning and communicating, calculating, make sure that you're, when the clinical day resumes, that you, everyone is calculating the clinical plans with the proper values. So once you've reset the parameters, 
be sure to verify that they're actually reset, verify that they're saved, and then run some test plans to verify that the um, calculation is giving the identical result to before any testing was done. So you wanna select some test plans that you'll calculate before and after any testing of MLC parameters within the B model. So once you have the calculations done, you can compare to measured values for your test plans, your actually IMRT and VMAT commissioning plans and determine the optimal parameter. Some more on this coming up. And so, as I mentioned, has quite a few resources for IMRT commissioning and now VMAT commissioning. So there's a planning guide, reporting forms, structure sets, all available on the AAPM website. The TG119 data set includes the CT files, the RT structure files, and then there's the planning goals and instruction document as well. And so the original TG119 shapes included the C shape, which is here, the mock prostate, which is here, we're trying to simulate the prostate with kind of a simplified geometry with the prostate target, rectum, and bladder, and then mock head and neck and multi-target plan. So you may or may not be familiar with these plans, but these are standard TG119 plans that have been used at many centers for IMRT commissioning. At my center, we've incorporated a few additional data sets to further test the TPS model. These aren't generally available. I'm just sharing this as information. So a structure set that imitates prostate with lymph node treatment, which is fairly common for us to perform with IMRT or VMAT, and then also a head and neck with simultaneous integrated boost. So these are similar, they're planned on like a solid water data set, like the original TG119, they're just a different type of uh, test plan. And then additional plans that you may use for testing would be representative plans from previous patients. So potentially prostate, lung, brain, head and neck, it's abdomen, IMRT or VMAT patients that you've used in the past that could help validate your model. So these would be in addition to the TG119 plans. So in terms of the DLG adjustment details, like what could be a, a process for test planning on the treatment planning side, you start out with just creating a good quality plan using the test plan structure set that's available, whether it's TG119 or a previous clinical patient. If you can have the primary treatment planning staff if you have dosimetrists or whoever does the treatment planning, have them actually do the treatment planning for the test planning. That way you're simulating the clinical workflow as, as much as possible. Once you have the treatment plans developed, then you're ready for QA plans. So you map the plan from, from step one onto the appropriate phantom. And I certainly recommend that both a chamber measurement and a planar dose or fluence measurement is acquired for these test plans as you're commissioning your system. And some options for the planar dose measurement include film, detector arrays, or the EPID. And then in terms of phantom, there's lots of choices here. Solid water, another type, the acrylic phantoms, detector arrays, and also just measuring on the EPID. So after you've mapped the QA plans, you can measure them compare to predicted doses from the treatment planning system calculation, and then compile these test plan results and analyze before making any adjustments. One thing I'd like to note here, we looked at this a little bit before, the IMRT and VMAT trends can differ. So we'll just have to be attentive to that as we analyze the results. So how can we interpret these results? So one of the questions that always comes up is which way do I need to tweak the value if to improve agreement? So the increase in the DLG value will lead to an increase in the calculated dose. So if the calculated dose is low, an increase in the DLG value will bring it closer to measurement. Increasing the MLC transmission value will also cause an increase in the calculated dose. So for our example here, the red is the planned dose and the blue is a film dose. So the planned dose is higher than the film dose. In this case, I would consider decreasing the DLG and or MLC transmission to better fit the data here. So hopefully that example makes sense. This would be how I would initially look at a single planning data set. So some practical points for emphasis, use real IMRT and VMAP plans to validate the B model and the MLC parameters that 
you're choosing. It's really important. These can come from PG-119 data sets, previous clinical cases. And as you select these cases, make sure the intended use of the LINAC for your clinic is, is going to be included and represented. So if this is going to be a stereotactic LINAC or if this is going to be mainly used for certain disease sites, you want to make sure that those uh, types of treatments are being included in the test case uh, suite. And the measurements that we perform should include both point and planar dose analysis. In terms of the, at Henry Ford, we are using the point dose measurements for the initial tweaking of the MLC parameters. That's just been a uh, workflow that's been efficient for us. And I can share a little bit more about that in the next few slides. So as you're going through your t adjusting the B model, one of the questions is, when is the model good enough? And so TG-119 and TG-218 both give some guidance on this. TG-218 is really designed for pretreatment QA um, for real patient plans, but we'll take that also as applicable for commissioning, since we're commissioning with the goal of treating patient plans. On the TG-119 side, they offered some confidence limits that were related to the participating institutions. And so the confidence limit that they give for high and low dose point measurements are basically like plus or minus four and a half percent. So if, if your high and low dose readings were within four and a half percent, then you would be within the confidence limit of the institutions that participate in TG-119. And those were all institutions that passed IROC Houston Phantoms and pass some other qualifications. And for the planar dose measurement, the gamma 3% three, 3, per cent, 3 millimeter passing rate, the confidence limit was uh, passing rate above 87.5% roughly. So that's from TG-119, the use of confidence limits to look at your overall data. TG-218 proposed tolerance limits and action limits for these types of plans. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a typo here. So the tolerance limit should be uh, 3% and 90% here. But the idea is that for gamma 3%, 2 millimeter passing rates, the action limit would be less than 3% ion chamber measurement result in a passing rate gamma 3%, 2 millimeter greater than 90%. So you can reference TG218 and TG119 for further information, but this is a summary of the confidence limits and tolerance and action limits. When you're looking at your results, always investigating outliers for maybe additional measurements or additional plans that would be used to take a look at those outliers. When we uh, adjust parameters for our models, we're looking to get the average percent difference close to 0%. So overall, uh, the mean difference over a variety of plans is hopefully minimized. And so not only trying to get the mean percent difference close to 0%, but also the spread in the QA results, the standard deviation, hopefully minimizing that value. And then a really good second check as you're commissioning these systems is to compare your values to other institutions into the literature, uh, especially institutions that have a similar LINAC and treatment planning system to your clinics. And if possible, getting an independent audit. We'll go over some sources for these audits in the next few in uh, later slides, but an independent audit of the IMRT and VMAT delivery is extremely helpful as well. So in terms of how much can you tweak the TPS values, my personal philosophy is to tweak as little as possible to get agreement that fulfills the clinical goals of the machine. So there's no hard stop here, but in my view, just tweak enough to get the B model in 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 a, in a condition that fulfills uh, the goals of the machine. All right, so this is a process that we use for one of our Linux 10 MV photon beam. So we generate the plans for the TG-119 data sets and the relevant clinical cases. We map these plans onto a phantom for measurement purposes and to calculate dose. We acquired measurements for these plans, point dose measurements in solid water and planar dose measurements with gaff, gaff chromic film. And then we compared the calculated and measured point dose values to tweak the DLG based on the comparison. 
and iterated as needed. And then once the DLG was set based on the point and dose measurement, we compared, calculated, and measured point and dose data. So this is the initial step. This is at the measured DLG value and the measured MLC transmission value. So that's 0.115 CM for the DLG, 0.0165 for the MLC transmission, or 1.65%. And then here are the high dose readings for TG119. And we see that they're systematically high. And there's a difference here for VMAT and IMRT. So that's iteration one. So iteration two, increasing the DLG. We see that we're starting to see the average result closer to 0% percent difference, which is good. But I, it looks like to me, based on this, that so we, can, we can adjust further. And so here we adjust, adjusted to 0.14 DLG and actually 0.115 DLG and 0.0185 MLC transmission. So it looks like we can adjust further. So this one we adjust MLC transmission to see the impact there. And so here we're back to the MLC transmission of 0.0165 and DLG of 0.16 CM. This is actually what we chose. So this is a DLG adjustment from 0.115 to 0.16 and no adjustment in MLC transmission. When we adjusted the MLC transmission further, we saw that the overall spread in the data increased. And so we were looking both at the mean value, the mean percent difference, and also the, the overall standard deviation. So even though this has a larger overall percent difference. So the overall average here is 0.16%. This is 0.62%. This has a smaller spread in the data. So we chose to go with this with this DLG and MLC transmission value for the clinical model for a 10X beam. So hopefully that helps with kind of the iterative process that you may go through to optimize the parameters for your beam model. And in our case, the average percent difference for the chamber readings was 0.62%. And that, that was the final value chosen for planning. And so just to reiterate, the decision on the MLC parameters depend on the clinical goals of, of the beam model. So which disease sites will you be treating routinely? Which modality will you be using more often? IMRT or VMAT, that can impact what you choose for the, for the end result of those MLC parameters. And the trend in the data, so which parameter values will minimize the disagreement between planned and measured doses? Which parameter values will minimize the spread in the results? Comparing planned and measured doses, that's the standard deviation. And which parameter values will minimize outliers in the data? And the question is, so we have to model VMAT and IMRT calculation models separately with different DLG and Eclipse. So you do not have to use a different VMAT and IMRT calculation model. So you can use the same model to, model to perform VMAT and IMRT calculations, but the DLG value, you may have to compromise and get an average percent difference, an average agreement that's good enough for both. The agreement for VMAT can be slightly different than the agreement you observe for IMRT. So that's just something to note and something to be aware of as you're looking at the effects of the two different parameters. So for our clinic, we use the same B model for VMAT and IMRT. And then, yeah, so SRS is a good question. So we use a different B model for SRS and SBRT. We found that the SRS and SBRT, the amount of modulation that's being uh, done for these types of plans, that a separate B model is warranted. So would definitely encourage you to incorporate that as you're, if you're commissioning SRS and SBRT to use a separate B model. In our case, the FFF modes that are used for SRS and SBRT, we don't use those for 3D treatments. So it's just inherently an SRS and SBRT B model that's tuned for SRS and SBRT treatments. So hopefully that helps with the questions there. And so, in terms of DLG sensitivity, we've observed that the in, in this case for this 10x B model is roughly two and a half times. The sensitivity for IMRT is roughly two and a half times two and a half times that observed for VMAP plans. And that's just based on the trend line. And for MLC transmission, it was a similar similar effect sensitivity.
activity was roughly two and a half times. This is not a hard and fast rule, just a, an illustrative example of the difference in sensitivity for IMRT versus VMAT for these MLC parameters. And so this is what I was referring to. Do we need a separate algorithm for SRS and SPRT? My experience is yes. So if we look at TG119, or at least we need the algorithm to account for the differences that we see in SRS SPRT plans versus conventional planning like for TG119. My experience yeah, for many Linux is that the level of modulation we see for conventional IMRT and VMAP planning is quite different than we see for SRS and SBRT planning. And what we've seen is the optimal DLG value for TG119 plan planning is different than for representative SP SRS SBRT cases. So this plot just shows the dose difference, plan versus measure. This is a chamber dose reading, similar to what we were doing with the TG119 plans for both TG119 and SRS SBRT plans. And so you can see there's about a 4% difference in the average chamber reading. The average for the TG119 data set is about negative 2%, and the average for the SRS SBRT is about positive 2%. So there's definitely different difference in the behavior of the two types of plans. And so we have to account for that with the B model. So I would suggest at a minimum, including SRS and SBRT plans in the validation set for any SRS or SBRT B model. And certainly I would consider just having a separate SRS and SBRT B model for SRS SBRT planning. So this is for a 6F, 6 FFF beam at our clinic, but this is pretty representative of what I've observed for multiple NX. And this is just the numerical data for this for this example. So we see a difference in the average between the TG119 data set and the stereotactic data set. And these cover about, you know, all types of deliveries. For the stereotactic, it actually includes 3D and uh, all the way to IMRT and VMAP. So hopefully that helps just give you more context for what uh, sort of challenges there will be in terms of commissioning a conventional delivery of IMRT VMAT versus the stereotactic delivery. So just some summary points in terms of MLC design, TPS modeling, it's dependent on the vendor. So just to make sure to keep in mind which vendor you're using and read the relevant manuals and understand the details, talk to your colleagues and make sure you become an expert for that vendor so you can understand the nuances of the B model. For MLC parameters, the DLG and the lead transmission, those can be measured using ion chamber and phantom. The sensitivity to DLG and lead transmission depends on the delivery modality. So for conventional planning, what we found is IMRT has a highest sensitive, highest sensitivity to changes in these parameters. VMAT is also impacted by changes in these parameters, whereas the 3D fields are affected, but the actual inner field is largely unaffected. And this can change based on the vendor that you're using for the treatment planning system. In terms of the DLG testing plan process, the process basically goes uh, from a starting point of treatment planning of the test plans, creating the QA plans, measuring those QA plans, and then compiling the test results before making adjustments and doing further iterations. And then again, the IMRT and VMAT trends can differ. So just be aware of that and account for that as you're making adjustments. Some practical tips on adjusting parameters on BMO, approved B models. These are just reiterations of before, but use caution. Don't make any changes before you have a plan in place. Always communicate what the plan is. Talk about it with relevant staff. This could be physics, dosimetry, physicians, but just make sure everyone's in the loop on what the plan is. And then once you've uh, made a plan with the appropriate caution and communication, then you're ready to calculate. Once you're done calculating the test plans, make sure that you reset the parameters back to the original clinically approved values and verify that the model is truly back to the original state before you started testing. And then once you have your calculations done, you can compare and do the adjustments to, you know, and see what the optimal MLC parameter value is. So, and for SRS SBRT, as we noted, the behavior is often different for SBRT or stereotactic plans. 
And so make sure that the test plans that you use for commissioning the algorithm use, you know, representative stereotactic plans, and you may need a separate algorithm to, to model the stereotactic delivery in an optimal manner. So just a final point, when the commissioning is complete or close to complete, make sure that all the clinical goals for your LINAC are covered within the test cases. Have an independent physicist from a different center or at a minimum, another physicist at your center review the data, including DLG. And if you can, arrange for an external audit of the process. Examples for these external audits include IROC Houston, that's in the US, uh, IAEA, IAEA, Equal Astro, and there's, there's publications with other information on these external audits. And an external audit could also mean just another local physicist running QA with their phantom and equipment to validate your model. And I just feel it's, it's very important to get that external kind of independent review to validate and make sure you're not uh, just falling prey to a systematic error somewhere in your system. And uh, so that's all I have. I wanted to thank you for your attention and certainly happy to answer any questions. Sorry, I went over a little bit, but I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this topic. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen. We really appreciate it. That was, that was very informative and we yeah, much appreciated. We can stick around for a couple of minutes if people have questions. Otherwise, it looks like the next session is tomorrow at the same time. But again, feel free to ask questions by just muting yourself or feel free to write in the chat as well. Thanks again. Yeah, my pleasure. And if you have questions while you're commissioning, my email address should be available. If it's not, I can make sure it's available and then feel free to contact me via email and would be happy to, to chat with you, you know, as you're commissioning, for instance. So definitely um, available at any point. So the question is, I'll bring that over here. Can you comment MLC output factor? Are they important for small field? So within Eclipse, the MLC output factor is not used for beam modeling. I don't have any practical experience on the pinnacle side. So I can't comment on the pinnacle side I, I, so in, in the Eclipse environment for variant tree implying system, the MLC output factor would be more of a verification measurement. So I would say they're an important verification step. We've, we typically use a lot of dynamic delivery for our stereotactic planning, and that's the main mode that we use to verify. We also verify uh, MLC based output factors and a variety of other measurements. So I would say they're important. Depending on the planning system, they may be used for input in the B model, or they may be used more for verification. Yeah, so we, we treat with both types of MLC. So within our system, we have two LINACs with a more micro MLC or with 2.5 millimeter width at, in the central portion of the bank. And then we treat SRS and SBRT with uh, the five millimeter with kind of standard Millennium MLC. And so depending on, so there's definite advantages to having the, the high definition or micro MLC. So without a doubt, there's advantages. Um, in terms of what's minimally necessary for SRS, we do treat SRS in SBRT with the standard Millennium MLC. It puts, so the planning may be a bit tougher to generate the plan that's acceptable quality but you, it is possible to treat SRS with the standard Millennium MLC. Under a, certain, under a certain field size, you'll run into limitations. So there is a limitation for each type of MLC with regards to what volume can be treated. I don't have the limitations, you know, just off the top of my head, but the Millennium 120 MLC will have the, the volume, treating the smaller volume lesions it will, it will be more limited in that realm. So you may only be able to go down to a certain volume of lesion with the standard width Millennium 120 MLC. So I, in the past, the one point of reference is the each lesion that you treat should at least be two MLC leaf widths. And that's more of a, a brain lamb recommendation, but the, the overall point being that 
for each MLC design, there'll be some minimum volume, minimum beams I view that's acceptable for the beam modeling purpose. So the next question is, how can MLC transmission be affected by leaf speed? So I'm not aware of any dependence of the MLC transmission value on leaf speed. This also may be vendor dependent, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm not aware of any dependence between these two parameters, the leaf speed and the MLC transmission. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, great. If we don't have any other questions, I think we could probably stop here. You know, thanks again, Stephen. We really appreciate it. And we will plan to see everyone tomorrow then. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Great. Thanks so much. Have a good day, everyone. Wonderful lecture. Thank you.